I looked at the item one with uh, three others. Yeah. And so I had a, uh, I was confused about the word group when you write there grouping at multiple levels. Yeah. Uh, because when I read it, I thought, okay, maybe what is it? Does it mean the subgroup or, you know, so that word group, I had a prop. I don't know if you can use some other word. For, I don't know, because it, I think you meant at the higher level, like, you know, the intervention grouping rather than subgroup analysis, right? So. Yeah, well, I mean, we can group all types of things and subgroup analyses are types of groups also. So it's really just kind of trying to convey um, I mean, I think the terminology intervention group is something which probably people, um, it is certainly in common usage. Um, and it's just trying to convey that, you know, within that you're bringing together a whole lot of kind of related items, I guess. Which items is the wrong word to use there, but related interventions. Yeah, I was just confused, so that's it. And... I think that's helpful, Rima. I think it, there are some examples where uh, situations where really it's quite hard to describe without examples. So um, that has been one suggestion about potentially integrating the examples within some of the texts. Joe, I think. Joe, Joe has a question. Hi. Yeah, uh, no, we, we did get slightly stuck on, on this whole group concept. Uh, I know it seems quite simple and we do use it in, in different ways, but having a shared understanding of, of, of what we're meaning, the explanation was really useful for that. And we kind of thought maybe it would be more helpful to present the explanation up front first, so that when you're reading further down, you then know what, but thinking about what you're meaning in terms of groups for outcomes, I, I, I'm still not entirely clear. Um, could, could, I, I, could you explain on that, please? I actually yeah. had a slide I was going to put up on that joke. I, I'll just very briefly say this. I'm sorry to cut in, but I had a slide which I took out of my slide set because I thought I was going to take too much time. But it's got a picture of um, measuring BMI, um, waist circumference and weight. And um, so with grouping of outcomes um, in a public health review, for example, people might do an analysis on BMI, a separate analysis on weight, a separate analysis on uh, waist circumference, or they might put all three together and call it weight or body fat or something like that so that would be an example of grouping related outcomes and there are multiple levels at which we can do that for most things when we start to think about it so yeah it's it's um and, and same with physical activity there are a whole range of outcomes even mental health outcomes we can broadly call them mental health outcomes or we can go down to very specific measures and time points and so Thank you. I mean, there's, there's kind of a lay language around it in some ways, around kind of grouping things together. So that's where it's really coming from to some degree. I think in terms of the outcomes, often we use the terminology domain and we're kind of using that in a similar way to group. So, I mean, you, people might be more familiar with kind of talking about outcome domains. Like Sue said, the outcome domain might be weight, the outcome domain might be depression. And then within that, you could potentially have um, you know, uh, the outcome being a specific measure of depression, so the Hamilton D or, you know, some other specific measure. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of got all these groupings and subgroups or domains and subdomains. So, and the reason, I guess, I think for that, um, the item around grouping of outcomes, we kind of use the consistent grouping terminology across the intervention population and outcomes because essentially it's the same thing applying to the different PICO elements. Um, I, I guess in practice, people often do kind of probably use the terminology domain in a similar way as group, interchangeably with group, um, when you're talking about outcomes. So, yes, um, it, it, the, it's, it's difficult. The terminology, um, obviously, is, it's hard to kind of get right, I think. There was one very last point I just wanted to add, to, which we thought was brilliant about the co the plans to cover any discrepancies. That 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 was really useful. So no, thank you for putting that in. <laughs> um, there was something that came up in our our discussion, which was around whether we've got this essential element around you know describing contingency plans for accommodating the volume of available evidence and whether that would be something that would actually have to be an essential element. 
Um, because for some particular re reviews, for example, you might have a very good idea that there's actually quite a volume of evidence there already. So whether in that particular case, you know, that would be an essential element. So I, I felt that that was something that we might want to um, revisit. I think certainly for some reviews, we would like to see more of that, but understandably there are kind of well-established review, reviews where that's not the case. Anyway, uh, Jacqueline, you've got a question. Um, yes, sorry, just on that point, thank you for, for, for that um, comment in, in, in the checklist, but I wondered if you could just expand a bit on what contingency plans would look like. Like I couldn't, in our group, we couldn't quite come up with any enough of... <laughs> Um, you know, off the top of our heads, so it would just be helpful um, if you could discuss, or oh, maybe from practice, what that will look like. And for both kinds, like I know you mentioned things like you know, you know, making narrow, broader groups. But is there anything else that you you think um, authors should be thinking about when they they want to make such plans? And you know, yeah, yes, so an example. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, an, an example, it's probably a poor one because um, I, I was just thinking about it before. So this is not necessarily a great example, but um, Sue and Miranda might come in with something better. Um, the one I was thinking about is if, for example, you were interested in the effects of um, individual antidepressants um, and then you came to, on, you know, for, for depression, and then you came and did your um, systematic review and what you found was that within each of the different types of antidepressants, there was only one or two studies. Um, this really wouldn't allow you to necessarily say much about what the effects of the individual antidepressants are. Um, so if you had, for example, specified in your protocol a kind of contingencies plan that said, if I don't have much evidence uh, around what the effects of the individual antidepressants are, what I might do is group at a higher level. So I might ask the question of what is the effect of any antidepressant on depression? And so that would mean, for example, that you would have a meta-analysis where you would have all different types of antidepressants within that one meta-analysis. So it would mean that you were answering a different question. You're answering a question of does there appear to be, do antidepressants in general appear to be effective which is obviously quite different to what you might um, set out to do to, uh, to look at the specific effects of each antidepressant, but you might not be able to do that because the evidence actually isn't there to address those questions. So that's, that's an example. I'm, I'm not sure if um, that clarifies things. I think, Jo, if, if it's okay if I just jump in for a sec, just to say I think it's, it's just about thinking about what might what the cases might be where you might not be able to do what you'd really like to do. So if you don't have enough evidence to, or don't find enough studies to do what you'd like to do, what are you going to do then? So just to give yourself a bit of forward planning and say, um, okay, so what I'd really like is all of these specific groups, but if I don't find enough evidence, what am I going to do? And giving yourself a plan for that ahead of time rather than um, finding yourself in that situation, struggling a bit and trying to work out on the fly what, what to do with those studies. Or, or even if you have done it on the fly, explaining clearly what you did in that scenario in the reported review would be really helpful. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, I think we've got maybe, uh, we might wrap up. I have a final slide here because um, it would be brilliant. Obviously, this has been, um, it's been very uh, fast and we haven't had much time for you to kind of um, have a good look at the items. Um, so if you are interested in, in giving feedback, that would be great. I'm going to hand over to Miranda, who's going to text, Miranda's leading the, the feedback aspect of all of this. So she'll be able to give you all the details. Um, I'll let you go, Miranda. All right. So um, I'll put this link in the chat as well. I think I've just got it there. Um, so we would very much like you to let us know, as Sue and Joe um, explained very clearly earlier on, um, you know, we've designed this checklist to address a problem and to, to try and give 
ourselves and other authors and editors a practical tool to help us address the challenges of trying to express, express the questions we're addressing in the review. Um, so the draft of the uh, checklist and the accompanying guide, including all the detailed explanations and examples, is currently up online and we would really love to get any feedback um, as detailed as you like or as brief as you like if you've just had one idea and you'd like to let us know about it or if you'd really like to get into the details of how it's written we would love that um, so this link um, it's up on task exchange um, but you don't necessarily have to uh, request um, to contribute as to the task um, in the way that you might if you're contributing to a review. All the links in the task, you can just follow straight to the online survey. Um, there's a couple of options about how you can provide your feedback. So if you'd just like to give us some overall comments, um, you can click, you can download a complete copy of the checklist. You can click through to the online form and just give us your quick comments. You can use the same form to give us really detailed comments on each item if you would like to. Um, the Additional option is if you would like to pilot this checklist and actually use it on a review or a protocol, either one that's in progress that you're working on right now or one that's already finished that you'd like to see if you can assess it using this checklist, we would love that as well. So there's an extra page in the online form and a few um, instructions on how you might like to do that. We would very much like to hear how that's gone. If you've tried to use it in practice, that would be really helpful. Um, so, yeah, we'd like this to be as useful as possible, as clear as possible. So please do let us know how we can improve it.